This is for us. Good morning. Um, I'm Julie Rowine, the president of the League of Women Voters of Concord and Carlisle, and I'm here to welcome you to our second First Friday of this year on the Community Preservation Act. Um, we hold First Fridays in most months on a variety of topics of local interest, and everyone is welcome. Our next program will be in the new year, 2020, Talking Trash, a look at trash and recycling locally, regionally, and internationally, what is happening now, and what the future holds for the disposal of our waste. We'll be on January 10th, 9.15 to 11 a.m. at the West Concord Union Church, which is a new venue for us. Uh, you can check our website, lwbcc.org, for details of all our upcoming programs. And we look forward to seeing you at future First Fridays. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Dori Kehoe, who is the co-chair of our Concord Town Government Committee, to begin the morning's program. Thank, thank you, Julie. Uh, and welcome to you all, and a special welcome to our guests from Acton and Lexington, who were generous enough to come and be willing to speak with us this morning about the Community Preservation Act. And when the Town Government Committee was first discussing what we were going to be doing and who would talk and what would be the subjects, uh, one of the things that we realized was important was to give some background um, on the CPA, how, when and how did it get started. Um, but first, I'd like to, to recognize the other members of the committee. Carolyn, you will meet later. Um, Stefan, it's the important job always of bringing the refreshments. So, without, without <laughs> Stephen, um, and Artis Gordon is not, not here, which, which I hope she is. Okay, she will be, I'm sure. And Marge Daggett. Um, and a special uh, note about Marge, I hope I won't embarrass you, but Marge came here from Lexington uh, when she moved to Concord, where she was an active member of the League of Women Voters. And what she brought to Acton, in addition to all of her other treasures and ideas, was the knowledge of holding First Fridays. This is something that the Lexington League of Women Voters has done. And so Marge brought that idea here many years ago when she came, not that many years ago, and she's continuing to help by taking notes today. So <coughs> she, she was Lexington's loss in, in Concord's game for sure. And so in thinking about how the Community uh, Preservation Act came about, uh, there was, as some of us remember and some of us have read about, there was a huge post-World War II building boom. And, and the towns, towns just exploded in so many different ways. And all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, I guess, more gradually, um, there was a realization that towns really were changing, that open space was, was disappearing, uh, that town centers, which had been historic structures, were beginning, in many cases, to kind of fall apart and needed help. And so uh, there was the thought, let's do something. And Nantucket was the first place to really do anything, and the Nantucket Islands uh, Land Foundation was started. And that, the idea was that there would be a 2% sales tax on land or houses in, in Nantucket, and the, the purchase of those would go toward the purchase of open space, to preserve open space. Um, the, uh, along came really the godfather of, of the, the CPA, and that was a man named Robert Durand, who was a state rep from Berlin. I hope I'm saying Berlin. 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 <laughs> uh, Berlin and Marlboro, who was a, an early preservationist in, in a very broad sense. And as a legislator, he really acted enthusiastically and with great persuasiveness and with great, I guess, sustainability, sustaining. Because for four years, he presented this act to Congress. 97, no, 98, no, 99, no, 2000, <coughs> yes, it was passed and signed by Governor Salucci. And so when the idea came of how to fund it, instead of taking the Nantucket model, what was decided to do was to instead, excuse me, have the money from the state come from fees that would be put on filings at the registry. So $20 for regular registry filings and $10 for municipal lien filings. Then the towns would raise their money by adding a surcharge to the already existing property tax, which, which each town and city had. Um, the, um, the, the state funding is divided among CPA towns. Now there are 175 um, different cities and towns in the state that have adopted CPA. Um, the, uh, interestingly, they can decide anything up to 3% of a surcharge. 
I always thought it was one and a half or three, and it can be anything up to three. But those who choose to have a 3% have really a second and a third bite at the apple, as it were, because there's one round, a beginning round of funding, and that goes to all of the, the towns um, that, that, are, that are participants. Those who, are, who have taken 3% um, go to rounds two and three. So I think Lexington, I know, has three percent. Does Acton? No. no, we have one and a half, and so does Acton. Um, but so getting it passed in the towns was another trick. Uh, as many of you will agree and not remember or know from other towns, it, it didn't pass easily when it went to each town. You could either do it by referendum or town meeting vote or by a, by a vote in, in, in an election. And so many towns had to go back one and two, and I think I even heard three times to get it adopted by the towns. Um, Acton adopted it in 2002, well off the mark, and, and Concord in 2004, and Lexington in 2006. Um, so each town, when they join, um, has to appoint a five to nine member committee. And in the, the commission, the committee is, is regulated in that there must be one appointee from a standing conservation committee, one from a standing planning board, and one from a housing board, um, others as, as desired. And when it comes to the spending um, of, of the funds that are raised, it's strictly regulated in that in every year, um, money must be apportioned and voted on every year annually, not if nothing is good permanently or even for a two-year time. And so 10% of the town's funds must be spent on a combination, actually, of open space slash recreation, and 10% on what was called affordable housing and has now been changed to the category of community housing, and 10% on historic preservation. Money doesn't have to be spent every year, but it has to be apportioned. So as, as Concord has done, I expect others of you have done, that you can put money aside next year, we put money aside, it doesn't have to be spent this year, but it's in the bank, so to speak. Now, as one of the issues, interestingly, that has never been really finally decided upon and, and how it's going to work out is any acts or any um, applications by churches. And as Acton found out <laughs> and, and raised- We have the scars. <laughs> <laughs> this was a tough, tough situation and as I understand it, it, it was adjudicated and then sent to a lower court, and then it was withdrawn. Is, is that correct? Something along that. The, so, the, was it, the, one of the institutions basically said, "Here's the money. Yeah. It's too yeah. much trouble." With one of one of the churches, one of the projects we approved, at the end of the day said, "Never mind," and gave us the money back. So yeah, it rendered so, it moot, so to speak. So and so it's still to be decided, which is why um, committees, uh, committee uh, preservation commissions or committees are requested and urged to talk with the town council um, before they take any action or bring anything forward. Interestingly, Concord will have a chance to do some testing on that this year as there are two <coughs> church applications and one which is in a sort of quasi-church related issue. Um, now, as this program became popular in the state, and now as I said, 175 cities and towns, it was gonna be hard to kind of split that pot. The pot was staying the same um, whereas the number of cities and towns participating in it were increasing. And so in 2012, a group which is called the Community uh, Preservation Coalition, which was started in 2001. Um, I just think for those of you who are on the committee's commissions have no doubt spoken to the, to, to the people in Boston. They give technical advice. And in, uh, in, in actually, in honesty, I, I went to them because there was nothing written giving the whole history of this, so they were very helpful um, to me in, in giving me the, the background and, and vetting anything that I said, so I think everything is correct, we'll find out. Um, but in 2012, the Community Preservation Coalition did a lot of lobbying and got the state legislature to agree that they would every year consider giving us part of the surplus, and as you know, surpluses don't exist automatically. If there is a state surplus, the state legislature may, in its wisdom, decide to give money to the different towns. Uh, they don't have to. We will find out on November 15th what the, what the big amount is for this year. But the coalition went one step further in a, in a very strong act that they got the legislature to pass, and that is 
that the fees, which originally were $20 and $10, have now been increased to $50 and $25. And it's anticipated that this will bring in $38 million a year to the Community <coughs> Preservation <coughs> Coalition. So that puts us in much better shape. And then each year we may or may not get money from it. So this is the, that's the background. But now the real story, and as we said in here, the evolution and present and past looking forward. I'd like to be hearing very much from our speakers on what their towns do and if they have any plans for the future. And so I'll let Carla Reed, our moderator, take over on that. Thank you, Dora. I appreciate that very much. Again, welcome to you all. My name is Carla Reed. I'm the chair of the Lease Communications Committee. And it's my pleasure to introduce the three speakers for today. Uh, each one of you may have seen a handout over in the corner there. If not, I encourage you to pick it up. It's two-sided. One has the actual bio biographies, the short ones for the speakers. The back has a list of a, a chart of various percentages of the, of the CPC allocations. Um, I'm not going to read the entire sheet for the biographies, but I want to highlight a couple, of a couple of important points for you. On my immediate left is Marilyn Fenelosa. Mm -hmm. She is the chair of the Lexington Community Preservation Committee. She serves on the Historical Commission for Lexington and is an elected town meeting member. She's a, a preservation attorney um, with a law degree from New York University and is a member of the Massachusetts and New York Bars. Um, and she also has a master's degree in preservation from Boston University. On my far left is Terry Ackerman. She's a former chair for the Concord Community Preservation Committee, and she has served on Concord's Finance Committee. For those of you who are from Concord, you know that she was elected to the Concord Select Board and is a select board member. Um, she's also a member of the Concord League of Women Voters, Concord Carlisle League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. Terry's got a master's degree in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School, and she served as the town administrator for the towns of Sudbury, um, Braintree, and Sterling. Um, she was also the assistant town manager for Sudbury. I don't know how you managed to get all that, but that's, <laughs> that's a pretty good litany of the towns. And then the gentleman to my right is Ray Yacobi. Um, he's the chair of the Acton Community Preservation Committee. He served as a selectman as a, a selectman appointee on how to improve town meeting mm -hmm. audience and attendance. That's Acton. Right. That's for Acton. I, you should take lessons on that one. Um, Ray has a, has a Bachelor of Science degree in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. And he's, he was on the Acton Planning Board for over 10 years, serving as chair for, the, for three of those years. Uh, he's been act, he's living in Acton and active in the civil affairs there for over 30 years. Um, and he's president of his congregation as well. So, in a very short nutshell, these are your speakers. And what I'd like to do now is get ready for the first one with Marilyn's presentation as soon as I pull it up here. Open up. There we go. Next step. Click. Marilyn, <laughs> here you are. Thank you. Just let me know if you, when you're ready to go to the next page. Okay. okay. Uh, just briefly, um, an introduction. We adopted, as Dory said, the CPA in 2006 on our second try. The first time we, we, right after it was enacted in 2000, the Board of Selectmen uh, put it on the, uh, the warrant and had a study committee that recommended that we adopt it, but at the end of the day, they decided that it was a bad idea. And when the Selectmen announced at town meeting it was a bad idea, town meeting thought it was a bad idea. Uh, the affordable housing groups in Lexington said, not so fast and came back in 2004, 2005 to lobby to get, this, to get this thing adopted. We were watching communities around us, communities around us, um, getting the benefits of 100% state match uh, as the, the state match pool was dwindling, and we said, wait a minute, what about us? So we adopted, we were successful in adopting it through a citizen's referendum in 2006, and we have never looked back. Um, the, uh, the, interestingly, the town's capital expenditures um, committee had testified the first time at town meeting saying this is a horrible idea. Mm. The second time they came back and said, boy, were we wrong. Mm. And it, 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 they have said, and since then, they participate as um, a liaison in our committee meetings and they said, this is the best thing that could have happened. Mm. And I think you'll agree. Go ahead. Mm. Uh, no, this, yeah, this is fine. Mm. Um, to date, $75 million that we have pulled in since in 13 years. Um, and you can see 41 units of housing, 90, if you can't see that, 90 um, 
projects, historic projects, 63 acres of open space, 51 recreational resources. This is, for us, it is an amazing resource. Go ahead. And this is kind of how it breaks down. Um, historic resources has almost half, but there's a reason for that. Uh, most of our town buildings are either historic or are historic by definition of being in our historic district, which is the center of town. That means that uh, our town buildings are eligible for CPA funding when they need a new roof. Uh, not if they need their grass cut because no maintenance is allowed, but if they need a new roof or if they need handicap accessibility or anything. We use CPA in Lexington to help balance our budget. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you flip to the next one? Can you start with it and just read the percentages because those numbers are a little bit small for historic resources. Is 19, a historic resource is 44% in the black. Yeah. This chart used to be yellow and... Orange. I don't know what happened between my <laughs> <laughs> um, This is community housing at 15%, open space is 20, and recreational resources is 19. And then we do have um, a separate accounting for administrative expenses, which is about 2% a year. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to be looking at next March when we go into town meeting, about $7 million to distribute. Uh, and that's based on our available balances, the estimated surcharge, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, that that's our taxes, the estimated surcharge. Um, Lexington has a lot of expensive property. The um, state match and, and um, interest income. A quick note about the 3% that Dory described. We, we are a 3% community, and for us, and, and one of the arguments was made, the difference between nothing and 3%, one and a half and 3%, is about the, the cost of a cup of co coffee at Starbucks every day. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it, it, Lexington uh, voters did not object to the extra one and a half percent. And what it has meant is that we get that, those extra two bites of the apple. Not a huge amount, because those extra two bites are determined by your population and your property values. With the bigger towns, and the higher property um, values being at the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. But still, it's enough to do uh, for, for distribution because it's, it's uh, distributed by, by deciles. Um, but it's enough to do maybe uh, a project uh, restoring some of our archives it, or some of our other projects. It's not huge, but it's certainly better than a sharp stick in the eye. <laughs> um, the state match over the last 13 years, even though it's been declining, we have received about $15.2 million from the state. The, um, okay, those are the numbers. I'm going to describe some of the projects that we've done to give you a flavor of how we apply CBA in Lexington. Uh, and the first one I told you was our, our um, historic building, our historic town buildings. The, the way that the definition of rehabilitation is written in the Community Preservation Act. If you are making a building fit for its intended use, that counts as rehabilitation. Everything in CPA is driven by definitions. So you can't maintain a historic resource, but you can restore it. You can acquire it. Um, in some, you can't support it, but there are, all, there are these, these various verbs that, that you have to comply with. Uh, forgive me for spacing out. Um, acquire, create, preserve, support, and rehabilitate or restore. And for historic preservation, you can do everything except support. Um, and you can re rehabilitate, yes, of course, that's not true. This is where the lawyer part of her kicks in and says, we got one. We are dead. Anyway, so we make our buildings fit for their intended use. And if that means putting a ramp on the front of our um, our town office building over here, even though the building was built in the in the 50s, it's it counts because the building is by definition historic because it is in our town center. Um, we acquired the community center. The, it used to be uh, the, the um, Scottish Rite headquarters. And 
That's where it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, the Scottish Rite moved their headquarters from this building down to, a down to their museum. It used to be called the Museum of Our Natural History, and now it's called the Scottish Rite Museum. But sold their building, which can, includes the historic mansion and a modern addition office administ administration, to the town for its community center. It has been the best thing that's happened to this town since forever. Um, the, the, it's well used. And uh, the, uh, the acquisition was about $10 million. The uh, rehabilitation was about $10 million. And they're asking for more money because they want to expand it. That's mm -hmm. what, wow. it, what kind of resource it's been. Mm -hmm. um, Cary Memorial Building, our, our spotlight building, our, our jewel, is where we have town meeting, where we have concerts and, and uh, discussions. And it was also refurbished. Again, $10 million. These projects are not cheap. And quite frankly, they would not have been done if it were not for CPA. This, this is the stuff that falls to the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing in Lexington, and I'm sorry to be so scary with these large numbers, but um, we have, uh, we're getting, even as we speak, a brand new fire station. After the fire station's done, we're getting a new police station. Oh, yes. We have just acquired, we have just finished, and we're about to finish a new elementary school after having done a couple other elementary schools. <laughs> um, and we're looking at a half a million dollar new high school, which as a, vote, as a voter and a taxpayer in Lexington just gives me the shivers. Mm -hmm. um, so this stuff would be at the bottom of the pile. The handicap ramp, the handicap ramp would have survived, but some of the other stuff would carry a memorial building. Would it have gold paint on it? No, no, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, and the library as well. Go ahead. Um, we also use um, the money for not just historic buildings, but also for landscapes. Um, I had to include this because it is worth reminding the people from Concord that the first battle <laughs> really was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is. Oh, dear. Dear. <laughs> He's armed. He's ready to go. He's got to have that thing next to him. At any rate, we'll go on in here. We, we have a master plan for, our, for the historic Battle Green, where it all began. Uh, this is the kind of uh, thing that would never have been done. But because we can do it, we can do it in a planned way. We can budget and we can accomplish the needed res restoration of our monuments and our, um, the green guy who is now, uh, who is now completely refurbished. Um, and interestingly, the only church project we've done is our first parish. And although it was a historic resource, it was also part of the historic landscape. And that's what sold it to town meeting. We weren't doing this because mm -hmm. it's a church. This is all before you. Uh, we weren't doing it because it was a church. We were doing it because it's the first thing you see as you step on the green. Uh, it is an, it's an icon of Lexington, and so we did a historic um, structure re report for the, for the uh, property, and they decided not to come back for the actual uh, rehabilitation. It was too, it was, uh, too fraught with uh, political mm -hmm. landmines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we've also done, uh, we've also done our historic um, cemeteries, and we also did a project with the National Park Service called Parker's Revenge. There is a part of the battle that is in the Lexington line, but working with the friends of the National Park, um, we were able to fund the uh, excavation of this area to determine where this battle had happened the, the, as the uh, Minutemen, the uh, British, uh, retreated. And really great stuff. We were, we were delighted to have this partnership with the Park Service to get to have it happen. Okay, go. I'm we're at the Douglas House. We're at the Douglas House, good. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of, <clears throat> this was an old factory in Lexington. We, uh, the, um, a, a nonprofit group, because remember, CPA is not just for government buildings, but it's also for nonprofit, bought the, this old factory and converted it into housing for survivors of brain injuries. Um, it, they created a, um, so it has, it is restored, it preserved a historic building. It uh, provides affordable housing because it counts. 
Uh, and they actually have an easement at the back, so they got some open space credit in there too. This is how you get the best bang for your buck in CPA, combining as many different buckets as you can. Okay, flip, because I'm looking at the clock. Again, another one. We bought an, op um, an open space. There was no, it was just land that had been farmed for generations. Uh, what we did is we carved off a parcel these, these haven't been built yet, they're going up right now for housing, and then behind it created a community farm. Hmm. Uh, again, two for one. Go ahead. I, again, a, a third one where we can, um, combined open space and community housing. This was a historic farmhouse, and this was their land. What we have done is we're converting the farmhouse to affordable housing, uh, and this now is permanently restricted as conservation land in the town. It's kind of over here from this house. Um, and they are using the barn for, uh, they're going to use the barn for educational purposes for the Conservation Commission. So it's, again, a win-win all the way through. We also, go ahead, um, use, I told you about using our, budget, our CPA to help with the budget. Just a little bit of a correction. The 10% is for open space. Recreation, it falls into the 70% everything else. 10% historic, 10% open space, 10% um, affordable housing, and 70% for recreation and anything that doesn't fit within the... I'm glad to get that. I actually had a, had a message in for Stuart Saganor and, and asked him that several questions several times because it's listed in the original part and never officially changed but I understand. I said, what's the story? Is this a separate one? It's, it's not 10%. They don't have their own bucket, which <coughs> makes them very annoyed. Um, but <laughs> well, the, that's what the, I knew that you knew the story of this, so I appreciate that. Good. So within that 70%, we are, are, um, our recreation committee has systematically gone park by park, playground by playground mm -hmm. uh, through the town, uh, restoring tennis courts, basketball courts, re-landscaping, putting in um, safe, safer approved by all these uh, organizations with initials, uh, playgrounds, <laughs> um, and, um, and including school playgrounds. For some reason, our school budget and our town budget are on different planes. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the, <laughs> well, but, well, they have different, they, as, as was pointed out to me, they have two sets of lawnmowers. The town cuts its playgrounds, grass, the school department cuts its playgrounds grass and don't ask me why they do it this way. But anyway, we're also working with the schools Oof, on their programs. I gotta hurry. Uh, debt service, We those big ticket items that I was talking about a few minutes ago, those are all, we finance them through bonds. But one thing, um, and one thing we do is take the, use the, uh, apply the interest expense to the buckets. Because at some point, you're going to run out of open space to acquire. Mm -hmm. uh, but you still have to keep putting 10% in there. If you, can, if you finance that purchase of land with debt, you can use the interest, the debt service for that and against the bucket. Because what you want to do every year is reduce <coughs> the buckets as low as you can so that you have the, you can, uh, you have the other 70% to use wherever you want to. Because you've used up the 10% bucket doesn't mean you can't spend more than 10% on any given project. What it means is, because you could spend 80% on a given project if you wanted to, but because you have to put the 10% in, you want to, to try to reduce it as low as you can every year. And we do that by putting our debt, assigning our debt to the bucket that the ultimate purpose of the project was. So if it was the acquisition of land, it goes into the open space bucket. If it was the it was a um, rehabilitation of Cary Hall, it goes into the historic bucket. Um, we also have admin, uh, an account for administrative expense, which we are allowed to do up to 5% under the CPA. And every year we, um, we set aside $150,000 for administrative expense. This we have a full-time employee who joins me in the audience. Tina is over there. Thank goodness. Um, why aren't you at your desk? Um, uh, she manages everything, including preparation of this report that we've got to talk about one of these people um, that, that we produce every year that has all of our criteria for grants. It has status on all prior years. So one thing she does every spring 
is call up every person that still has an outstanding project and say, where are you? How much have you spent? When are you going to finish it? Uh, it, has all, it has all of our numbers, and it has project descriptions for everything, every Warren article that's coming before town meeting. Uh, so it's a, like a little history book that gets updated every year. Um, uh, and I think I'm just about done. It's posted online, and we distribute this at town meeting. Every town meeting member that wants one gets one, because and they read along with us when we are when we are um, going through our projects. So we love it. Um, I love it. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to Lexington since in many many years. I think it's been a tremendous resource, and I think we've used it fairly wisely in maximizing our projects. Uh, we use it for matching funds. Um, with the DHCV, with the Massachusetts Historical Commission, we leverage our, our money. We apply it to as many projects as we can, many buckets as we can, and as many purposes. Um, oh, go to the last one. Okay. And I think we have a lot of community support. <laughs> we put this sign that says the project is funded in part by the citizens of Lexington through the Community Preservation Act as a PR matter. We want ta Lexington taxpayers to know where their money is going. But um, one of the, the um, maintenance guys came in and said, Bowman School, her bridge, one of them, appended this sign to thank us. These, this were the kids whose playground was fixed with CPA money. So it really is a community resource. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is going to be Terry. If I can find the presentation, hold on. Let me get it right up here. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, Terry. Just give me a nod and let me know what you're. All what right. You're do. Well, th thanks a lot, Marilyn. That was really interesting. We have a lot of similarities <laughs> and and um, some differences. Um, you, Lexington, of course, is a lot larger town, so we're going to be talking about smaller numbers. Um, I've been asked to speak about the past. Um, I'm not going to speak about any current requests, so if those are your questions, forget it. I don't know, <laughs> and I don't want to know yet, but um, I'm going to give you uh, the flavor of um, what's been happening historically in Concord, so we're ready for the first slide. So we have 1.5% out of the possible 3%, and while I was on the committee, um, we talked about did we want to try to lobby for the 3%? So I was the one who got drafted to go to the Finance Committee and sort of feel them out. And whoa, I almost got like, thrown out of the room. So I was like, yeah. But um, really talking to the people on the street also, we love the CPA, but I really don't think their support um, at the ballot for raising taxes up to the 3%. So I think. We're happy where we are. As it, some people want to get rid of it entirely. I think they're crazy. I agree with Marilyn. It's the best thing ever. Um, and some people want to raise it to three percent, but I think the majority is happy where we are now. And we also have some important exemptions, as you probably know. Um, the first hundred thousand of taxable value is exempt, and uh, persons with income less than eighty percent of the AMI are exempt. Uh, seniors with income less than 100% of the AMI are exempt. And we have the state match. Um, so that's just some background. And um, the next slide we have, I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about these projects because you guys look like you've been to these town meetings where uh, most of you where these got approved anyway. But we have um, the Peter Bulkley Terrace and um, the Wall Street Concord Housing Trust and the Lally Woods and, and um, Emerson Annex. These are some of the examples of our community housing projects. This number, 22%, um, this is the average between uh, 2006 and 2018. Um, when you combine all those years together, 22% of them went to community housing. Uh, next slide, we have historic preservation. That's the very beautiful large painting up in the townhouse in, in 
What do we call that room? Not the selectman hearing room. The non-hearing room. The non-hearing room. We can't hear any of Yeah. We're looking at putting a rug in there or doing something because we can't hear a thing in there. But we do have the beautiful paper. So uh, that's, that's good. Maybe we'll, we'll put in for some CPA funds to get that room a little bit quieter. Um, the townhouse exterior restoration was done and accessible entrance. That's four different projects. And um, the Row Birth House, the Neshotic Bridge Restoration. These are just some examples of historic preservation, which is way higher than 10% because we're a historic town. We have a lot of good projects to do. And as Marilyn said, we can do a lot of what would have had to be done in the town budget anyway, like um, renovating the townhouse. Uh, next slide, open space. And this 17% has gone up. We're almost at 20 now. So these, these percentages fluctuate depending on, on what comes in for requests. Um, some examples are Warner's Pond, and um, we did the dredging feasibility study. Um, next down the pike, we're looking at starting to um, do some dredging. Uh, but that, that's a current project, so I don't want to get into that. So that may or may not come up. Um, Hubbard Brook Farm Field, uh, Warner's Pond Dam, um, and Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. These are all projects that have been done under open space. And these are just examples. We have many, many projects. The list is, I don't know, three pages long, you know, single space like this. It's a very long list. Uh, next slide. Terry, before you go, can I ask you one quick question about this? Because I do know. The top right, Hubbard Brook Farm Field, says Town of Concord and Conser Concord Land <coughs> Conservation Trust. Why the two labels on that? Do you know? No, I don't. That's 2007, and I was not were on they, the committee. Were they a co-sponsor or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it sounds the, like... All the rest of the state. It looks Concord. like they were a co-sponsor. Okay. Because um, actually that ties into uh, matching funds, which is a very important criteria. It's not required. But um, at least when I was on the committee, we looked much more favorably on projects that had matching funds coming in. So I suspect what that means is, like similarly with um, Balls Hill or some of the other projects, when there's a co-sponsor. Um, another one that we did recently is that meadow over by um, Lowell Road. I can't remember how to meadow. Oh, oh, Cass pasture. 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 pasture, that's it. And Little Women, um, the movie, donated most of the money for it, and all we needed was another couple thousand from the CPC. So those kind of projects are wonderful because we can add the last part of the matching funds and get the project done. So um, we don't absolutely require it, but I remember when the Masons came in, they wanted to put the roof on. Um, redo their old roof, and that's right in the middle of the Monument Square. Um, really needs to be done, but it's not a town building, so, you know, what do you do about that? But then they came up with a pretty good match, um, and we sometimes made a contingent that we would only award the funds if this match actually came through. Mm -hmm. um, Emerson Field, is another enormous project. Um, I'm one of the ones who's been pushing for um, a pretty good match for that, which so far we haven't gotten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We're, uh, the sports groups, we want them to contribute. Yes. Yeah. Before you move, the reason I'm no. just guessing that there might be two people on there, okay, but I trust in it, is because when you require land, you have to put a, a restriction, it. restriction on it. Right. Yeah. And the town can't hold a restriction against itself. Okay. Ah, so thank it you. could be that oh, that's why the land right. trust yeah, is in there. Exactly. Yeah. We had the same thank situation. You. Who holds the title? Oh, the title. 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 But the, but the right. right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good. <laughs> you being an attorney, that helps a lot. Okay. And then uh, recreation, uh, we have the field uh, renovations. White Pond projects, yeah. Doug White Fields, and Bruce Freeman Rail Trail um, being some recent examples. We've got um, an average of 
of years. Um, okay, so our next slide um, talks about the time frame. Can you guys read that in the back, or should I read it out? You can't. Just do an outline of it. Okay, well, basically, we have some info meetings, which have been really good. D. Ortner, um, my, the chair before me, started this. And it's really good for new applicants. They have no idea if they even want to apply or not. They're thinking about it. Like we had um, Habitat for Humanity. And they wanted to do an affordable house. And they wanted to figure out if they could apply for CPC funds. So for a group like that to come and listen to the informational meeting, what is our application process? What are the deadlines? What do you have to do? So we have two informational meetings now, one in June and one in September. And we have a very early application deadline um, at the, toward the end of September. Ooh, and that that's so the CPC um, committee can go on the site visits before Columbus Day. We had a lot of scheduling issues with Columbus Day being a problem. <laughs> um, then we have applicants come in and present at CPC meetings during the fall and by the time we get to the end of November we have a public hearing where um, we present what the recommendations are going to be to town meeting and the reason this is so early is it has to go into the Warren article by December so we're one of the first groups that has to finish its recommendations in the budget cycle. So it can be kind of difficult. We don't know yet what all the matching funds are. We don't know yet some of the legal opinions. Town Council later reviews every article. Um, one year, we had one project funded that Town Council figured out later could not be funded under the very strict definitions that uh, Marilyn was just going through. So, um, one of the questions that Carlin had sent us was, uh, where does this town council money come from? And we're not totally sure, but we're, we're researching it. <laughs> but uh, I've been talking with Stephen Crane, and he, he and I both think that it's coming out of the regular uh, town meeting funding for legal, because town council has to review the legality of every single article in the warrant. Um, there's no sense in having the citizens vote for something and find out later. It's, you know, let's get the town council review done first. So um, we've been pushing for it to even be earlier before the public hearing so that we don't even recommend a project. And this year, um, I guess, there are several church projects that are being reviewed by town council um, because of the act and decision there's a lot of the indecision, shall I call it. The, the uh, court was very... Uh, Wishy-washy. Well, yeah, wish yeah. So we're happy to have town council figure that out, because I've, I've read that opinion twice, and I'm like, huh? Yeah, so, okay. So anyway, like I said, I'm not talking about current projects, but this is something that does happen, and stay tuned, we will find out. Um, so that's our timetable. Terry, before we go off of this one, um, the, uh, if I remember what Dory said correctly, November 15th is roughly when we'll find out about find out about the state match. Right. And where that shows up in the terms of your schedule, that's just before a public hearing. Yep. That's correct. This year. That's not this year. I understand, but but that's no, but the that's true. Time frame. You're absolutely right. So what we do, that's a good question. What we do is we estimate the state match. And then we adjust it later. So okay. it may be by the time we get to the public hearing that we've just found out the day before and the committee hasn't yet voted to adjust, but we still have time before we put that Warren article in to have another meeting and um, add. We usually are very conservative, so if anything, now we can go up and increase our um, a recommendation for different projects. Okay. Thanks. Um, Okay, um, yes, so again, I agree with Marilyn. This has been absolutely fantastic. We have appropriated $20 million over the years. Um, now it's probably up to $22 million or so. Um, these are projects that mostly would not have gotten done. So this is like 
fabulous because the priorities in every town are schools and public safety. You've mm -hmm. got to be realistic. And recreation and open space and historic are not at the top of the list. And so they never get funded. So the CPA has been a godsend, really has helped. And in terms of the town versus nonprofit organizations, first of all, I don't like that distinction. There are these quasi-projects, such as the library. The library was counted as a non-profit organization, but really, the average citizen, you know, uses the library the way they use recreation, the way they use the townhouse. They're not gonna, it, it, some of these are some, they're, they're both public and private. So it's a kind of a weird distinction, first of all, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> Some of the other projects we talked about also are part private, part public. Um, but if you really have to make the distinction, the projects that are 100% town um, are, have been 72% of what we've funded. And has that percentage been changing over the years? It's hard to say. It depends what requests we get in. My personal opinion is I think we're getting more town and fewer privates recently, but I'm not told. You know, it could fluctuate again. So, Terry, I'm having a good day. Terry, on, on this slide, there's an acronym of F O P A C. Do you know what that stands for? Yes. Friends of the Forming Arts. Players, uh, 51 Walden. It's Friends of the Performing Arts. Right, Friends, Friends of the Performing Arts. Arts. That's 51 okay. Walden Street. That's a very good example of a town-owned building. So it did, well, actually, that was a complicated town council opinion that I'm not going to get into. But um, that's a town-owned building, and they needed to make it more accessible and um, it was questionable whether it applied, whether it applied or not. Um, okay, so a couple other things. Number six and seven. Your last slide. Your second last slide. Last one is. Yeah, we're not. Um, okay. So has Concord uh, considered funding projects? Brought by religious organizations. Oh, good. Only one minute. That's a great Basically, for religious organizations, I think um, we're, we're using the historic criteria. We have criteria in general. We have criteria for historic, criteria for open space, criteria for housing. We use the same historic and general criteria for religious as everything else. But then it's also subject to the town council opinion because... We want to be really careful about that. Um, and then um, finally, we're on, uh, this is our URL and monitoring. I wanted to talk about that for one minute. If I can find my notes on that, which I can't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I'll make it up. Right. So, of course, uh, the way that we monitor, um, or, um, well, the way we report to the town meeting in the article. It specifies so many dollars for project one, so many dollars for project two. You've all seen this it's in, in an article. And that's how we report back to town meeting on the warrant. Then monitoring, um, Heather Gill sent me a whole thing on that. Here it is. Okay, so the staff monitors the open projects, and we also get biannual status reports on each project. Also, the um, once a project is funded, you have to put in receipts. So the reimbursements come in for the non-town projects and purchase orders come in for the town projects. And it's all something that Heather deals with. We don't really have to know all of that level of detail, but that is how the monitoring takes place. So <coughs> turn it over to Ray and okay. take questions later. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ray, can you see the screen okay? Do I need yeah, to just... I can see the screen fine. Can oh, everybody hear me in the back? Hold on. Let me get the presentation up. No, no. Right. Could you see Hold that? On. Joe's going to keep me on this straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Joe used to be on the CP. 
a committee for quite a while. Okay. Okay. Take it away. Just to kind of, so I don't want to take a lot of time on religious institutions. Can I do a disclaimer up front? Okay. Yeah, please. The ones that we have gotten into, the criteria has been historical preservation. That's it. So it's been there, but obviously, if it's a working institution, et cetera, it can get money. So that's kind of our criteria, has always been. Um, also, as a disclaimer, I've been on the committee for three years now. I was actually appointed to the committee because I was a chair of the planning board, so I was a planning board representative. Um, I've been chair, um, this is my second year as chair. Uh, so I'm relatively new, so I don't have the breadth of experience that the prior two speakers have. Um, but I do have some very similar experiences in terms of, of what it is and um, what is that. And, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong in some of the things. I'm glad you hear. Uh, we adopted it now. What the year? I think you mentioned 2004. It was 2003. The data that I got from our staff was we adopted it in 2003. Uh, quite candidly, I think the primary impetus, because it was something new, that town meeting adopted it was for open space. That was the hot topic button in town. Open space, open space, and we always had issues whenever a Warren article came up to do open space. So as I would say, the impetus was primarily around open space. Um, our funding sources, uh, again, we did the one and a half percent, okay? Um, I will apparently, we, the board uh, appointed a committee two years ago to look into whether or not we should go to three percent. Um, the committee that uh, kind of looked at it recommended that we do, but I think for political reasons we have not decided to go forward because, again, as soon as you get a tax as a percentage, it becomes very politicized. Uh, at this point, we just chose it wasn't high enough priority to push forward, but we have discussed it. Um, we have two exemptions for low and income moderate seniors, and the first hundred thousand dollars of uh, property tax is very similar to uh, Concord. And the spate match in our in, during the history has been between six point seven and seventeen percent. Wait, six point seven or sixty-seven? Six, 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 seventeen percent and sixty-seven percent. Oh, there. Okay. Wow. The, um, in the categories, again, as you can see, you'll notice is heavily weighted to open space and recreation. I think the recreation one is a little skewed because of the Bruce Freeman uh, trail, rail trail, um, which I think Concord is dealing with now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, you can see the percentages, the administrative is 824. We've uh, allocated in total about $11,800,000 um, during that time period. I want to echo a lot of these projects would not have gotten done. Uh, very, very different, very, very simple. But again, you can see, definitely skewed toward recreation and open space. Uh, we did want to kind of spend a couple minutes on where does the administrative money go. Uh, we have our planning department probably does all the uh, uh, general administration program. Uh, also the finance department in terms of receipts and the collections. We do use town council. We vet our projects before we consider them. So when we get our applications in, the committee sits down and says, mm, I'm not sure about this one. We send it to town council before we even spend time considering it. Okay, Where that has come up more so recently have been on private projects, not private public. But for example, last year we had a condominium association submitted an application for the preservation of a bell tower. There's an old church in town that's now condominiums. It's Mill Place, it's right on 27, is one of the most visible places you'll see in Acton if you're driving down 27, but it's private. Hmm. Those are extremely controversial when you go to town meeting. You know, yeah. Why are we giving up? Uh, but we vet them, town meeting voted. In fact, I was challenged this year at, on the town meeting floor saying, this is a bad thing, you're setting a precedent. And I said, no, we're not, because every project still comes to town meeting. Hmm. Bingo, you depoliticize it. Someone said, why it was historic, why it was important, and et cetera. So that's what we got. But we have town council at least give us some counsel before we even spend any time on the project itself. Okay, I'm going to go through a quick summary, or again, some highlights of some of the projects that we've done. Again, this is, I'm going to have to read here. In the center, uh, there is a um, Satcham Way, which is a town where there was some community housing done. Um, the Regional Housing Services Office, we do work on the upper right hand corner is the old, I guess, goes, you might remember the Regional High School, which is now 
um, community housing and elderly housing. The McCarthy Town School. Is right, the old, the old McCarthy Town School. Mm -hmm. So again, to give you a flavor of the kinds of projects, and this echoes some of the projects as you've heard in the other prior to. Um, it's also, I would say, on housing, uh, in the last couple of years, it's become more of a focus, more of a focus from a policy standpoint. Um, and again, this has been a bit of an educational process, which I'll get back to. And we're trying to become more proactive opposed to reactive in terms of using it as a policy instrument when we're going through this. Um, and again, the historic resources, uh, we're, we're, I guess, we're the stepchild to Concord and Lexington. Because you always hear about the Battle of Lexington Concord. <laughs> And I've only lived up here 32 years, so I've been, but I have to say, the first person who died at the North Bridge was Simon from Acton. Anyway, I had to get this. The lower left, we did a, again, this is an example of a we put town yeah, yeah. We did a um, uh, library uh, restoration project. The bell tower on town meeting. The upper right hand corner is, uh, I think, a, a very nice house. This is the League of Women Voters uh, house where it was made handicap accessible. Um, and they did, we did a fat, fabulous job of that. But where is that located? That That's on, uh, if you know where Town Hall is, yeah. you walk about 100 yards north and it's right there on the left. Cool. My kids went there for ballroom dancing when they were in school. <laughs> And the most probably one of the more, more recent ones, and I think I, I do want to um, focus how the committee's kind of looking at this as opposed to just quote unquote preservation. The Hosmer House, which is a very historical house in Acton. However, if you went and did a poll of people in Acton and said, Where is the Hosmer House? they didn't have a clue. Yeah. This project was restoration and actually was, was worked on jointly because it abuts school property. And if you come to the town now, we're making it, uh, a, we're doing a restoration, but making it much more accessible for the public so the public knows it's even there. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea between even the historical preservation is not just preserving, but educating and making it accessible. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, kind of philosophically what we're trying to do with it. Mm -hmm. Open space, uh, again, this one is, we have a fund balance, essentially. So right now we have almost $2 million sitting there ready and available, because these things are episodic. We can't always plan for them. We have a very active uh, open space committee. Uh, when they come with their projects, we ask them, okay, oh, you're asking for money, where are you gonna spend it? They say, we're not sure, but here's a priority list, here's the properties we are looking at, here's what potentially we could spend, and then oftentimes that list is larger than the current one, so we're just trying to get ahead of the curve and put the money aside uh, in terms of what that, again, I would say initially, this really was the focus. This is what people, if you ask people in town what was community preservation, they would have said, oh, it's open space. Okay. Uh, recreation. Uh, this is one of my um, favorites. Okay. Again, there's a statutory requirement of the three bucks of the 10%. Um, recreation is not one of them, but if you'll notice, our recreation gets a lot of attention. Um, this is near and dear to my heart only because there are, to, to highlight what would not get done, it's first on your list. Because people say, oh, like, example in town right now, we're dealing with the new twin elementary school that's going to be like $150 million. And you know what? That, that's what's going to get all the attention. Mm -hmm. Anything else is like, oh, we'll get to it. Mm -hmm. um, but my historical one, I moved into town in 1986. I actually lived in North Acton across the street from what is now Narrow Park. Mm -hmm. It was a quarry. Yeah. The town went back and forth and back and forth a year. Should we even do anything? It's a bad idea. Um, they finally did, but then came, came along came the Community Preservation Act. If anybody's familiar with North Acton Narrow Park now, it is amazing as a resource to the town yep. that we would have not invested in otherwise the way we have. Okay, I think I, the other one is a, a favorite of mine because I, I bike and I ride in the Pan Mass Challenge every year, the Bruce Freeman Trail. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. Another one, and I, Congress is going through this now. I want to separate out two issues here, I think. One is the idea of doing it and be what is a cost because you'll look at some things in these and you say, 
That bridge over two way costs $2 million. That's crazy. I might grant you that. That's a separate issue. These are state requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But again, as a resource in town since that is opened a year ago, is it's a transformative. Yeah. Uh, including on that trail, there's the old pencil factory that I didn't even know existed in town. Now there's a plaque, so there's a historical element to it. Uh, we just recently, the uh, TJ O'Grady skate park. I want to mention that one simply because that's the one we work with uh, Boxborough on. Which one is that? Is that the top? Upper right. Upper right. Upper right. Okay. That was uh, actually a young gentleman died in a car accident. I mean, got hit riding his skateboard, and this was developed. There was matching funds. It should back up. All our projects, we look for leverage. We don't have a quantitative, it has to be, but we look for leverage. Matching funds, what are you doing? I don't think we funded a single project yet where it's 100% has been matched in some fashion, okay? Um, but this one is a regional facility. Last year, we, got, we worked with the Boxboro CPC and they put money toward it as well. So that, from our standpoint, was leverage because it was part of the Act in Boxboro um, school complex and we said well why shouldn't they contribute we That's did talk great. to them they said it made sense uh, and, and they did that the lower left hand corner is a new one it's a jones field uh that is in south acton near the rail station um my, my kids used to play baseball there that's completely going to be renovated over there very expensive but it's like a 200 and some thousand dollar project um that is in process and then just generally basketball courts um, the lower right-hand corner is the Acton Arboretum. Recently, we put uh, a Japanese garden in there. There's been a few things where things are being developed more. Um, in summary, this is what I like to spend a little bit. Okay. I want to kind of emphasize what I've heard, from my, at least some wise. This is an excellent example of really good local public policy. Mm -hmm. Once we got over, should we do it or not? What's nice about this, this is money they set aside. You don't sit there and have to vote on it. It's money that's allocated and prioritized for certain types of activities. So we don't have the debate, should we do a park or should we? It's where should we spend it? How should we spend it? And we work with the um, Board of Selectmen on because they give us their priorities every year too. So we know what their priorities are uh, in terms of, but this is, um, I think a great example of we now have institutionalized the process. We don't go through the debate. I don't think we should spend the money on a, on a sidewalk or something like that. This is probably in, in the 13 years I've been working with the most collaborative process I've seen. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a committee I'd love to work on. Uh, we have depoliticized a lot of what happens with this. We have That doesn't mean we don't have vigorous debate. We have good active, vigorous debate on these projects, the, uh, especially like on these private ones within the committee. There's some people that's philosophical that you should not spend any public money on a piece of private property. But we have a very um, constructive debate. And then when we go to a town meeting, we can defend it, which I think is good. I'm going to echo again many projects that serve, I'm going to emphasize, that serves the broader community. This is not about a constituency saying, I want to preserve a barn that no one cares about. I'm being a little facetious. But the projects just serve so many, like, my God, we're, Nara Park is a good example, yeah. Bruce Freeman is a good example, what we're doing now with the Hosmer House is a good example, the open space where we have a lot of trails now, are good, where a lot of people are benefiting that would not benefit otherwise. Uh, and that's only because you have this infrastructure to do so. Because if you took anyone one by one, they'd get picked off. You still have some, that's what I like about it. That's what I mean, it's good public policy. It doesn't have to go to special town meeting because we're going to do a firehouse, uh, which has so many. Um, and that's why I would say high level of community utilization. That's something that we have been focusing on. Is the broader community going to benefit from this? We had a project we turned down two years ago. Someone wanted to rehabilitate a barn. It met all the criteria, but it was a barn in the back of this gentleman's property. No one's going to see it. No one's going to benefit. So we kind of said, we passed Mm. Even though we could have, with legitimately court of the law, we could have approved. And someone has said, hey, go get the money from them. Yeah. So we do have to guard <laughs> against that. Well, think about it. Oh, oh there's a pot of money. You need some money, go see them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I want to kind of get to the thought. The accountability, we do a vigorous follow-up every six months. We actually started this recently. We have a, uh, our planning staff has a spreadsheet so we know where every single project is, what's going on, where it is. We had an issue a couple of years ago where a project turned the money back because they never got to it. Right. So we kind of said, what's this all about? 
So we're doing a, a better job of working on those things. Uh, we have a similar uh, annual report we give the town meeting. Uh, a lot of the processes we follow are exactly like what Concord does, except ours is two months for the back. <laughs> we, are, we get our, our applications are due in the middle of November. Um, and probably in terms of evolution, I think we're starting to get a better handle um, on how to use it and how to use it as a policy instrument. Uh, like, for example, recently someone on the committee said, how come we don't push housing more? Because housing is an issue. <laughs> because we're heavily laden toward like open spaces, like there's never a debate, almost. But this is a nice framework to have that dialogue and say, okay, let's talk about it because one of the people, the, uh, the housing person said, we know we're not spending enough percentage-wise. Again, you only have the 30% that you have to spend this way, and you have to put them in. You have the other 70% that you could go, like any one area could do 80%. Uh, so I think that is, um, uh, has been very, very beneficial to the town, and it is now evolving in terms of the committee, in terms of how we use it. Um, and how we can, because at, at the end of the day, we have to present a town meeting, we have to defend it. And I think saying that this is money well spent for the community, not for an individual, you know, group that is lobbying for its point of view, but we really try to say, how is this going to fit in not just the individual constituency, but the broader community? And like I said, there are things that we've done now, people say, yeah, they take it for granted. I mean, oh, Bruce Freeman Trail. It's amazing the amount of traffic and activity. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. this is great. I mean, it makes me feel good. Yeah. No. Separate is, does it have to cost that much money? <laughs> the answer is no, but that's not the issue. That's not our purview. No, seriously. If you can separate out the issues, you can depoliticize and focus on things. And then, and then that's not our problem defending. Good. In fact, I will say my last comment is this year when we went with our list of projects, uh, it was on the consent agenda. Not a single one was pulled, mm -hmm. and we got consent. virtually unanimous oh, approval. That's, wow. wow. that's a good test. That was really good. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a question and answer period, and the way that we're going to do it is follows. For this is going to be a couple different tiers. First. I'm going to ask the panelists if they have questions of each other, one or two max. Then I'm going to ask one question, and then I'm going to have Dory ask a question, because she worked real hard putting this thing put together. And then if Marge Daggett wants to ask a question, because she worked on this as well, she can ask a question. And Artis, I see you sitting in the corner. If you feel like asking a question, you get third shot. After that, after we get this done, I'm going to open up to questions from the general audience. And I have to ask you, if you ask a question, Keep it to under two minutes, please. <laughs> because I have a person with a stopwatch, and I have a person with a paddle, and I'm not afraid to use them, okay? Okay, all right, so let's go back. A first set question is, do the panelists have a question that you want to ask each other about how things are done in Lexington, in Concord, or in Acton? No, I, only, I do. Both, how, how is the nature of your interaction with the board of, of select people and finance committee? The finance committee is always the fun one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dear, you, you were served on the finance right, committee. How many right. times this was yeah, yeah. And you're on the select board well, now. Well, we one. never cause any problems. You know, we just agree to everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, the select board it does the same thing that you do in Acton. We give the uh, list of priorities. Um, we also try to get a list from planning board of their priorities because a lot of the projects that we get, historic, housing, open space, they all come kind of through the planning board. So um, if those boards don't give us a list of priorities, then the CPC asks for them. And, um, so we just, um, select board just gave our priorities a few weeks ago to the CPC. Um, These are priorities of projects that have come in? Yes. Okay. Yes. After all the, in fact, only the town projects. So that was yeah, a little bit strange. So let's say you have 10 projects and seven are from the town. The town boards are asked to prioritize within that. Now in terms of the finance committee, um, they have a liaison that comes to the CPC meetings. Okay. So. And then um, 
The CPC usually gives a report, um, like every other group, to the Finance Committee, and they take a position. And if they have a problem, you know, they'll ask questions about it. But um, I don't remember any major problems when I was there. Um, okay. I, All right, I any follow-up, Marilyn, on this one? We have um, two Finance Committees, an Appropriation Committee and a Capital Expenditures Committee. Each <laughs> one of those committees... Yes, I know. Okay. Uh, each one of those committees has a liaison to the CPC who sits in our meetings, who gets all of our materials, mm -hmm. and who participates in the discussion. Mm -hmm. They then have their, at least the capital expenditures, I don't know about appropriation, but they have their own he hearings mm -hmm. at their meetings, bringing, calling in all of the candidates, the project sponsors, mm -hmm. okay. and they grill them again. Each of those committees issues a report. In addition to ours, are you seeing some overlap here? <laughs> Each of these committees issues a report and makes their recommendations, as in you said the selectmen too. Um, our committee is nine, nine cats to herd. Um, the, and three of those people are selectmen appointees, and one of those three is a selectman on the committee. So that person acts kind of as our liaison to the selectmen. He lets us know if he knows and if he can what their what their thinking is. So we usually don't get any surprises, but then um, before the, the they issue their the selectmen they make their final reports because they all give a report on every project. Okay. Um, I get hauled in. All right, now, that's good. Do you ladies have any questions that you want to ask uh, to Ray? And, uh, yeah, I have a question ahead. for each of you. Um, I forgot to say in the monitoring and, um, and in the leverage, we have a rule in Concord that we kind of forgot about <laughs> that we now are using. In our criteria, it says that after 30 months, if the funds haven't been spent, they're supposed to go back to the reserve. Um, right? That's two and a half years. So we um, had some staff transition and we had some new people on the committee and we were looking at that long spreadsheet and we had some projects that still had funds in there from five or six years ago. The project wasn't finished yet. And so, Ray, you just reminded me of it when one of your comments. So I'm wondering if... Um, so now we're going through and monitoring those projects and saying, hey, your past 30 months, you know, come see us. There's a way to get permission to continue, but you don't just automatically get to keep the money. So the Robbins House was one example that did come in and finally is finishing their project. Um, I, I could ask John. No, huh? you're not going to ask oh, John. Oh, never mind. All right, all right. He's yeah, the current chair of the okay. CDC. Well, He's here graciously. That's, that's all right, all right. Well, anyway. Um, Stop. Yeah. Okay. 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 Marilyn, how about you? Do you have any questions, or shall we go to the next well, question? Well, you you guys, my question is whether that's you guys have <laughs> okay. that kind of thing. Answer? Fire away. Okay. I, I think in the last two years, the, the question of monitoring was the issue, how to institutionalize it and not have it be, because we don't want something, the vagaries of staff turnover, vagaries right. of, so what we've done in the last year, actually, we've institutionalized the spreadsheet that we have, and we're asking the project uh, owners to report back in every six months, mm -hmm. and that gives us basically two windows, uh, one, if you will, just after town meeting, going into the application, and then one before town meeting so we know where everything is and we can ask those questions and we'll use that as a framework for example recreation has been an issue for us there have been numerous plots all great plots but some of it has fallen by the wayside and it was this reason it was that reason so we're kind of telling those applicants by the way <laughs> this is going on so why should we consider your project now if these ones aren't being administered so that's how we're kind of managing that Correct. but I think the, the twice a year input from the project um, applicants gives the committee to be informed to say, okay, we know what's going on now on a more ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Other than, because I think the initial emphasis was just on the application. Mm -hmm. And then with the application, oh, well, they're going off and doing other things. That's kind of where we, that's part of the institutionalization. Okay. Very well. Our wake up call came from town meeting last year. We monitor for all of our projects and report on it. But when a couple applicants came in asking for new money, we had town meeting members stand up and say, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. It says here in this report 
that you still <laughs> still have open money from 2010. Right, right. Why should we give you more money? Uh, <laughs> uh, so we did a little bit of searching, and we can't, we the CPC can't unilaterally uh, cancel projects. Right, right. It has to go back through the process once it came, which right. means the town meeting would have to cancel those appropriations. Right. So what we did this summer, we did, Gina did this summer, is called up every project in this book that has something still open and said, when are you going to finish? Right. Yeah. That, that, that. Yeah. And yeah, prepared a spreadsheet. And we have, we have asked each of those project sponsors to come into a meeting and explain exactly right. what their projects are. And if they are coming back for more money this year, they have to give us a full report in, right. in front of the, in this right. open meeting about yeah. what they're doing on their old projects before they get another dime. Okay, Correct. we're about ready to get the hook. I'm going to ask my one moderator question, and that is, how much public input do you see on the projects before it gets to town meeting? I'm going to start with Ray, go to Maryland, and then Terry. Well, we, we do two things. We, we encourage the applicants, mm -hmm. um, and we actually will flag a project. We think something's going to be either particularly controversial or has issues with it will indicate to the project applicant that they need to do outreach. So it's not just the committee okay. doing this, but it's working with the applicant saying, yeah, this is great, but the filter, I at least personally, what are we going to do when we get up at town meeting and how are we going to defend it? Mm -hmm. We try to anticipate that question. Mm -hmm. So our committee has been very good, I think, of people playing devil's advocate and asking those mm -hmm. questions. So if we see a question like that surfacing, we'll say, we'll tell the applicant, you need to do some work here. All right, Marilyn? Two things quickly. We have a public information session before town meeting, yes. and we explain all the projects to the town meeting members and anybody else. No, that is wants that the public them. hearing that you're yeah. talking about? No, Something it different. is an information okay. session that we have before on every article that goes to our town meeting. There is an information session, and CPC is one of the things that has to get explained. But different from, from um, Acton, we make our project sp sponsors justify their projects to town meeting. Mm. I will introduce the sponsors them. go up? Yep. Wow. Okay. So if it's a recreation project, the, head, the chair of the recreation committee stands in front of town meeting and has to explain why they want that money for um, any given project. Or some of the nonprofits, they stand up and just have to justify it. Um, we re can only recommend, but it's up to town meeting to decide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Well, Terry's turn, then we we'll, then we'll may have to move on. Terry, what about you? Well, I don't think we have a lot of public input um, on this process. Actually, we have the public we have the public information sessions in June and September. Then we have the applicants come before the CPC in an open meeting in the fall. Then we have the public hearing, similar to Maryland, um, in February when we have all the articles that are going to go to town meeting. But I don't remember a lot of public questions at any of those, or a lot of attendance either. I do remember, though, um, a citizen approached me privately, and also at town meeting there's questions. And the questions I remember had to do with our previous thing that we just talked about, about, well, this group still has open money from six years ago, and what are you doing about it? So that was a good comment, and we went back and we... Um, worked with that group and and got some accountability. Okay, but your your sessions where you have the applicants come and give their presentation yeah. to the committee, they're not though, well attended. But, but they are public meetings. Oh yes, yes. Public yes. Meetings. absolutely. People can right, right. come if they want. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. For all absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Yes. People just don't know it's about it. I think okay. I think it would be helpful if the public did come to those meetings yes. instead of waiting till town meeting for their yes. questions. Uh, quiet please. We'll give you one more minute and then we'll finish up and go to the questions from the audience. Marilyn first and then Ray. Just one thing. Um, all of our meetings on everything, mm -hmm. applications, everything, are public except, and this is big except, if it's usually if it's a land acquisition. Okay. Those are held in executive session. Right. Yeah. And the reason mm -hmm. they're held in executive session is that as soon as the seller of the land knows that the town is interested in buying this and there is a very deep pocket to okay. dip into. Yep. Right. Those projects aren't announced until there's some yeah. sort of contract signed. Right. Okay, Ray, you got last, last word, then we're going to turn to the audience. Okay, sure. No, I was going to uh, highlight two comments. One is 
this this our committee has the same issue any other committee comes like no one ever comes unless it's something that's an effective that's reality yeah. okay mm -hmm. so yeah we have all the open meetings but you have to anticipate that someone's going to get up at town meeting and say ah you didn't tell me that. <coughs> we i just want to argument we with our sponsors we don't require them to present but if we know we have a potentially controversial, we ask them to be there to defend mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. I can call upon them if town meeting member mm -hmm. says, what about this? We'll say, okay, Mr. Joe, you need to say why you think this is a good idea. It's not just that. So we do okay. have to do with some semblance of that. Thank you all very much. Now we're going to do the series of questions. We're going to go Dory first, and then Marge, and then artists if they want to questions. Then I'll open it up. Dory, go ahead. Yeah, just a very, quick, a very specific question. I'm interested in affordable housing. Um, and the question I, I'm talking with Marilyn when we um, negotiated with Marilyn, <laughs> begged her and pleaded her to come. Um, it was one of the reasons we were interested in Lexington's point was something that Lincoln has done. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think you alluded to it briefly. But can you explain a little bit more about something that, that Lexington has done in helping to purchase a property? And my understanding is that each room that was a, a resident living in, in that room is, is counted on a percentage for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain a little bit about how the, the CPA in Lexington and Lincoln, I know, has done that? Um, well, I'm not sure I understand your question, but we have guidelines whenever our housing group, well, this isn't really that one, but uh, whenever our housing group buys a property, we have guidelines, kind of investment criteria. <coughs> that is, <coughs> if you are buying a property, for um, affordable housing, it can't be more than so many rooms or bedrooms. It can't be so many, you can't have a, a value per unit of so many. And one of those criteria at the end of the list is, and it must be eligible for the SLI, inv the SLI SHI. SHI. SHI inventory right. the, that the state maintains. Because we also have an eye on 40, well, town meeting certainly does have a, 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 their eyes on 40B. So if we can, <coughs> excuse me, make a property qualify as affordable housing, we will do that um, by whatever criteria that the state requires to make something eligible. And in the case of the Douglas House <coughs> that I showed you, the state said these are all affordable. And in fact, if you um, Google affordable housing in Lexington, Douglas House comes up as one of the places. And it's because the, the residents there, they're not working. They are, well, or if they are, they're working in um, minimum wage jobs because they are survivors of brain injuries. They oh, I see. That was but it was in Lincoln, yeah. I believe, that there there was a house which was purchased and for people who had a low income, and each bedroom was counted as a single SHI. Mm -hmm. No, uh, so it's, so per unit, it's per house, unit. It's on a each, unit each basis. Unit. Okay. So if you have a condominium with fifty units, you get fifty credits. Oh, yes. If you have a house mm -hmm. you, that has one resident, you get one cut out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dory. Marge, do you have a question for the panel? Uh, just, I, I wish uh, that Marilyn would would um, go go back over the ten percent. The reason is, I thought it was that, that I noticed that Lexington in uh, FY19 spent zero on open space because we had no projects. We don't go looking for projects. We are reactive, not proactive, um, and because we don't feel our, we don't feel that's our job. Uh, but if so, if there are no open space mm -hmm. projects, then their ten percent goes into the bucket. For, oh, oh okay. it gets banked. Yeah. Right. But it, but there's nothing to spend. Oh, it's banked. Okay. All right, artists over the corner. Do you have a question? Yes. I'm interested in the tell that has town council vet the articles before they even come to the CBC. I'm wondering what is the timeline on that because our our process starts in August really and closes pretty much when when the warrant is mm -hmm. uh, closes. So how does that work? Is it do people agree with that that that's a fair way to to do it? Or why, why do you do that? Okay, you want to, you want to repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Uh, the, the question essentially is about using town council. What's the timeline? Right? Okay. Okay, our, our timeline. And, uh, I'm sorry, our, our timeline when we use town council is when the applications come in. We look, the, the, the applications come in. 
uh, staff actually reviews them and says we flag two that need town council input before we even consider it. Okay. So we don't wait until later. It's right off the bat. Does the committee spend even any time considering the application if there's a question? They go to town council, they report to the committee, and then we decide, well, if it's gray area, do we want to proceed or not, or let the applicant know we're not going to consider it. So we do it at the very, very beginning of the process. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, we're different because we're volunteers and town council isn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we vet are the projects. We vet every project gets vetted by town council, but after it's gone through the committee in a preliminary uh, preliminary review so that if it doesn't pass the laugh test and we know that right. or it's just it's just not something that we want to do we're not going to send it to town council and have him bill us at X number of dollars because we do that vetting too okay. so we, we what staff does is does that filtering for us they okay. come in they said okay these there's no question as far as staff are concerned we don't even send those to town council in fact town council does not review every project we do Oh, well, we have guide, we have guide because we have enough historical guidance now that the committee does not need to say we know this is okay. Can you please say it's okay? <laughs> we have enough precedent. We just do it. And our we have our staff is very good at saying this one. You need to look, have them look at before you even consider right. it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's open to town council. Uh, to town council. <laughs> 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 the questions. Uh, Janet over in the back. Okay. I. I'm wondering about um, uh, looking far into the future for some of these projects. Um, the, the decisions made now may seem very appropriate, maybe appropriate for now or the next decade or two, but in, in, in the far future, things may change. Um, for instance, the land that has been farmland I was thinking of the farm project over in Lexington, I think, where the farmhouse was conserved and then for affordable housing and then the farm mm -hmm. land was put in open space. If it wanted, if somebody wanted to farm it again at some point, um, it, would that be a possibility? Um, if somebody wanted to use the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, for instance, for small electric things, you know, to uh, transportation of some kind, would that be possible? So um, I'm just wondering, in the far future, um, we may want, for, for uh, reasons of food security in New England, we probably can raise about half of the food that we need in this part of the country. Um, would that land be, it would be possible to revert to farmland? I think it depends on the purpose of the acquisition. Um, certainly, if it's if land is acquired with, for conservation, it has to stay in conservation forever. That's the deal in Massachusetts, um, and there has to be a uh, a conservation restriction placed on that land when it is required acquired forever. That has to be approved by the state um, uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. They have to sign off on it. So, if the original easement said, a uh, restriction said, this land can be used for open space, which includes, by definition, at least in CPC, but the easement would have to say, which includes farming purposes, then yeah, it's the same for housing. If you, the town buys a property for housing or creates housing, it has to have a housing, a, a affordable housing restriction on it forever. So they couldn't later tear down that building and make it something else. It has to stay housing. Mm -hmm. And the same for historic. If you buy a property with the specific purpose of historic, um, it, because it's a historic resource for rehab, you have to place an easement on it that says it will stay, it will meet certain criteria, it will be preserved. It can't be developed forever. That's the way the thing is set up. These easements are a fundamental part of the, the um, acquisition process. And however you define it going into that easement agreement, if you say that the house has to stay historic, but, um, but, you, can, but you can modify it in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards, which would include putting a ramp on it so that it could be uh, for ha handicap housing as well as um, low-income housing, that's okay. But you couldn't tear that down and put a swimming pool there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Terry or Ray, or either one of you? Yeah, I would, I would say, 
in, in, I talk too much, I'm sorry. It's, okay. it's hard to divine 10, 20 years from now. But I know an act is what we've done. When we acquire a farm, like the Morrison Farm, I think, we actually maintain it as a farm. So we actually develop public gardens and public, mm -hmm. you know. So it, I don't think we've had a case, I think really answer your question. I don't think we've had a case in, in our situation where we've converted a use that was farming and then put a restriction on it that you can't do farming. Mm -hmm. So I think something you would have to do that in order not to go back and use it to, to, to Maryland's point. So we have not consciously said, taken farm and made a conservation land and said you can't farm on it. You'd have to do that in order not to be able to go back. Okay, Terry, I'm going to give you a shot because I have three questions already pending. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Fine, okay. <laughs> um, Diana, so you're first, um, then I'm going to go with Mary and then Judy. So Diane um, and then David after that. My question is, um, uh, and it, 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 it can, can, um, conflates with exactly what some of you are, are mentioning. Why do we not say that when we buy um, open space and open land, that with it comes some portion for affordable housing? <laughs> I mean, uh, you do in Lexington? I mean, I think this, this ought to be a, a kind of a, a, a proviso that, that comes with all acquisition of open space because we're constantly looking for opportunities for affordable housing. And we've got all this open space, um, but we've not, we've not established that from the get-go. And I just wonder, um, I just want to... No, the, but, the, yes. but the farm view thing that I showed you that mm -hmm. had the three houses in the front, that property was acquired uh, when they bought it there was a little time lag, but they were. It was. It was originally brought to town by the um, recreation committee. They wanted it for a soccer field. Well, that didn't go anywhere, but it ended up open space and housing. And when it was funded at town meeting, uh, the property was cut up for um, housing was identified and came out of the housing bucket. So whatever the cost was, it was two million dollars, and a tenth of it is um, is for housing. That we separate we separated it out for housing at the time that it was acquired, mm -hmm. because once you acquire open space, mm -hmm. you can't develop it. That's, That's exactly right. That's the reason. That's a good question. Okay, uh, do Ray, do you or Terry Ray, do you want to add Terry? I'm going to say that. Hold that, it. Your name's not Terry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. I have you here. Um, well, I think in the Jerome property, this came up, right? Yeah. And um, I think we have it straightened out now um, where there is mostly open space, but there was one section carved out for an affordable house. And I think after a lot of jockeying around, I think we have a solution that's basically working. Um, so maybe that could be a precedent for some of the future purchases. I don't know. Okay, right. Yeah, I, th I think that, that's, that, that's a hot topic, but... At town meeting because mm -hmm. their definition of open space is you're not developing it. Right. And sometimes the justification is we mm -hmm. want this open space because someone wants to come in and develop it. So it's it's like uh uh we're buying it so you can't develop it. So it's off the table. Okay. That that's really the case. All right. Thank you. Now we're going to do Mary, then Judy, then David. Mary. Hi. Um, I have a question for Marilyn. Marilyn, one of your slides you said debt service. <clears throat> yes. For Lexington, I assume that means that you borrow money. Yes. And that you pay off the principal and the interest of that loan with a future revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, last true? year we had, let me get to it quickly. Um, last year we had $3 million of debt service, which was the payment of principal and interest on uh, four, uh, the acquisition of the, of, uh, the farm that is open space and affordable housing, the acquisition of our community center, the, uh, the rehabilitation of our Cary Memorial building, and uh, a center track project. These are big ticket items. Right. Um, well, you can't afford with we can't years afford, years or but, that but we bond them. Uh, okay. This is all. This is not something that we decide. Right. We we have the uh, assistant town manager for finance come in and just tell us whether it should be bonded or not bonded, whether we should pay it out of free cash or borrow. Mm -hmm. And then we take that, and then um, the, the, as I said, the interest and principal comes out of the bucket that applies to the project. In the future years. So Going forward, and we bond for, I think we bond for 10 years. Okay. Uh, um, so okay. for 10 years, that okay. money is going to go there. And the other thing you should know, though, is that once you do that, once you bond a project, you can't shut down right. CPA until all that debt is paid off. Right. Right. So there's a bond. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Right. That's okay, does anybody else on the panel want to talk about this before yeah. we move on to the next one? Okay, Judy. Yeah, um, I had a question for Marilyn with regards to with regards to um, <laughs> too much. Uh, you mentioned about the church and that the first yeah, and so the first time the church applied, it was uh, proposed a town meeting and they approved. But then the second time round, the if I understood correctly, the CPC decided not to propose the public. applicants. Could you the, the church people decided, oh, they decided that it was much too controversial mm -hmm. and they didn't they didn't want it to go to, through the effort of, okay. of having town meeting pay for it. Mm -hmm. And and the first application, what was the focus of it in terms of the, how for a, a historic structure report? which is where you bring in structural engineers and architects and they look at a building, they look at every inch of a building and say, there are powder post beetles in the, in the basement, you've got to shore up the basement, or the roof has a leak, or the windows are falling out. Okay. And they do that in a report, which provides a road map for your rehabil rehabilitation plan. It prioritizes. Okay. You can't do, if you, do, if you have a leaky roof, then anything else you do is gonna be a problem later. So you fix the roof first. Yeah. And so armed with that report, and in fact, um, we had an enlightened public facilities um, uh, director who did that kind of report on every town building before he came to town meeting and said, this is what we need and this is why we need it. Uh, he was very enlightened. Um, <laughs> the, but, um, but they didn't feel, even though they knew that those windows had to be cocked, they did not feel confident that to come back to town meeting because it had been controversial, even though it was per, it was had been blessed by town council mm -hmm. and the federal government at that point because it's a I don't want to go there. Okay, uh, Terry okay, or you. Ray. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we our our experience mirrored that. In fact, when mm -hmm. on the North Congregational Church when they came to us, what the committee said was, we need a master plan from you. That got us, into, quite honestly, in the lawsuit. That was one of the issues that the litigants brought up. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're into managing and planning, etc. So, uh, and then they decided to withdraw because it was just too much trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. we we tried to do the right thing. And you could have. And we and could have, uh, but people objected. Mm -hmm. Okay, Terry. Thank you. Anything else, Jess? All right. Uh, I've got David, Julie, then Linda. David. Ray, I'm not sure. My memory is quiet, please. Shh. David, sorry. Go ahead. Ray, I'm not sure my memory is correct here. If it is, you said that in Acton, you're moving more toward a proactive rather than a reactive approach. Did I? Did I yeah. if, well, if I did, could, did, I no, no, I, I did. could I get you to expand on that? What expanding on that is more public information meetings, more education about what CPC is, but as a committee saying, what is our priorities as a committee and as a town? So when we go to do, we have basically, the way I look at it is we have 30% that is statutory requirement. What do you do with the other 70%? And which constituencies? We're trying to move away from having, let's say, someone who's really progressive always putting up in space to kind of say, well, wait a minute, housing is important as well. How do we reach out to the town and say, by the way, we'd like more input. That's what I mean by being proactive. Not proactive in terms of doing an application, but more proactive in saying, as a guidance for us, we get our priorities from the selectmen, or the select board, sorry, uh, but also in terms of where should we be doing it? How can we use this more proactively? Because we're seeing such, I think, good benefit from what we're getting out of it. But the more awareness there is, the better we can utilize it because we're, you know, we're nine people. So we'd like to get more input. That's why you have to be proactive. I recall you uh, pointed out how collaborative and how important it was that it was collaborative. And you're making collaborative across the town. Absolutely. Across we're, town. They're, they're, we're collaborative with the town itself. That's why I asked about the finance committee, the one group that's not terribly collaborative. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we had an issue with this finance committee. It really yeah. is being collaborative. <laughs> and okay. I, I would have, one of the reasons I like this one is universally, and you've echoed this, people saying, wow. This was good for us, not good for me, not good for this, but this was good for us. And if you, again, I'm a little biased, but if you go to Acton now, you've got the Bruce Freeman Trail, you've got Narrow Park, you can just look all over mm -hmm. and you say, how many people are benefiting from this? Mm -hmm. It's a broad cross section. So that's me about being proactive. Okay, let's give the other two panelists a chance to answer. Terry? Well, um, I want to follow up 
question on, from Ray then. I'm wondering, when you say proactive, are you asking groups to come in and submit applications to no. you? You are just, um, so do you have a lot more applications coming in than you can possibly fund? No, we have not had that problem the last few years. So okay. that's, not, that, that's not our issue. It's more education okay. and outreach and collaboration, I guess okay. is the term. Okay. And okay. what about Mira? Do you um, have a lot more coming in than you can fund? Well, until last year, we had not. Last year we did. and we uh -huh. had to, So we had to set our own priorities mm -hmm. based on what we had done before and what we perceived were the major needs. But, okay. And I don't know about this year. I have a bad feeling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's get a... I just want to point out, Stephen, Parker, on the other hand, has always $3 asked for every dollar available. No, or something like no, no, not at all. It's, um, no? we have funded, I'd say, 75% of, of the, um, of what come in, what's requested. We've done really well with CPC. But you've never had a shortage of that. We haven't had too much of a shortage, maybe a half a million or something. So in other words, we get two and a half million of requests. We have 1.9 million to spend, something like that. Okay, let me give you a, a time check. We've got about 10 more minutes for questions at this point. I have down, uh, Julie's gonna be next and then Linda. So if anybody else wants to ask a question, you can stick your hand up and I'll put you on the list. So Julie, it's your turn now. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm very interested in the idea that's come up in several different contexts about the value of projects that check more than one box mm -hmm. or are of interest to more than one constituency or serve more than one group of people in town. And I'm wondering um, if, when you look at a project, do you find that the person who had, or the group that has proposed the project is connecting those lines for you, or do you have to work with a project proposer to say, hey, this could also be, for instance, here's open space, maybe we could think about housing also, or this is farmland, you know, so how does that process work on each of your committees if you're thinking about those projects that are, I would say, have a higher value because they serve a broader purpose? Okay, Ray, Julie's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's just in front of me. <laughs> it's a combination. Like, I think the way the dynamic is such that, again, this part of the collaborative and outreach, the, the applicant may not be aware. Mm -hmm. So we might because we have on the committee, by the, we have advocates for each of those groups, we'll ask. And they might, housing might say, guess what? This could be a housing and historic. Mm -hmm. So there's a dynamic there. Some applicants come in and they're already well versed. Uh, some applicants, we encourage them while they're doing their application to talk to town staff. And town staff might say, oh, by the way, did you talk to? So it's kind of a, a, an organic process at this point. Uh, some are better prepared than others, like in anything else, and, and in other cases, they're uh, clueless because they've just heard about this and they want to get an application in. But that's where the, the committee, that's what I mean by the, the, the committee is so collaborative. We have a committee that says, oh, I think this could be, because it could be a housing thing as well. So this gives us more flexibility. Okay, yeah. Terry or Marilyn, what's your... Well, yeah, we have basically the same thing. We have nine people. So one is from recreation, one is from um, historic, one is from housing. Um, we have um, about half and half. Sometimes the applicants already come in, and the most common thing is open space and recreation. We have a lot of projects that come in under both of those headings. And so our decision then is to decide, should it be 50% in the open space bucket and 50% recreation, or should it be, we had, that's what it usually is. We had one project that we decided was 25, 75, that might have been Giro. Um, but that's usually kind of a debate as to, well, is this most, is Giro mostly open space? Is it mostly recreation? Um, and then sometimes the applicants come in and we try to work with them collaboratively on having more than one bucket, because I agree with you, the more constituencies, the more people you can serve, the better. Okay. Hey, hold on just a bit, Marilyn. Well, we have a history, so I think the Conservation Commission, which is the one that brings in all our land purchases, knows that if there is an inch of, of, 
of land that they can that they could sacrifice for housing, they're going to be asked to do it, and they, they don't even, so they know that that's going to happen, uh, and they also know the town meeting is going to insist on it. So we don't structure the project; it's just not our job. But when uh, but conservation knows that if they're going to come in and ask for 10 acres of land, they're going to have to, to find a place to put some housing on a piece of it if they want to get through town meetings. Wow. How did you do that? Yeah. Did oh, you just gonna, let's do, we're we're just going to, I mean, the, the other flip side of this is to pick up on Maryland's point, CPC is very definitionally driven. So actually we've had cases where people said it's conservation, it's not, it's not. so we correct that. So that's kind of going <clears throat> dynamic as well. Right. Okay, All right, I'm going to take Ingrid out of order, Linda. Hold on just a second, but Ingrid, why don't you well, go ahead and follow this question? Well, I think that's setting policy. That's setting town policy. How did you do that? We didn't set it. Well, how town meeting you? set it. Town meeting has decided that we have a critical need for affordable housing in, in Lexington. And if there is an open space purchase, the only way we can justify the open space purchase is if we can accommodate some housing on the on the land. And how did you do that by a, 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 a something you passed a warrant article? How did you do that? How did you get there to that decision? Because that's that's really key. Yeah, I would love. It. Do you know? Yeah, that's what it sounds like what you're saying is there is no written policy, but it's a political thing. Right. That's exactly. a good thing. Just no town meeting will not pass it <laughs> unless. I think that's right. You know, yeah, and you have represented town meeting, so that's a little different from that's all the right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go. Just a yes. little. Let's go to Linda. Linda, do you still have a question? I do. Please. I do. Um, I'm interested in your uh, what percentage of your projects are multi-year projects uh, in the sense that it's going to take more than the funding that you can provide this year. You've already spoke about uh, the bonding strategy, and I'm wondering uh, what other strategies you use, but also how you view uh, potential projects that are, quote, multi-year projects. In other words, they may be coming back to you for more than one year of funding. Okay, who wants to take this first? Go. <laughs> <laughs> the okay, first. For, for, let me leave parse the question. Most of our projects are multi year. Okay. Okay. Now, and I, I need to be multi year needs to be broken into two pieces. A project that we know is going to take more than one year to complete, or a multi phase project, which mm. is a different issue, mm. which is okay, we have phase one. We may be coming back for phase two. We haven't committed to phase two. We just went through this last year. Uh, with the Asa Parlin House, which is right behind Town Hall. Um, and a lot of controversy back and forth. And we, after a lot of back and forth, we approved $175,000 to do some abatement work, but there was no commitment for the next phase because we didn't have enough information. So we went to Town Hall. When we went to Town Meeting, we explained that. We said, there may be, and the Finance Committee got into our knickers on this one a little bit because they said, you need to tell us how much more money you're going to need to spend. And we said, we understand, but we can't, but there's a critical path issue. We can't ignore what we have to do right now. Uh, so that's kind of how we handle it. And we've done the same bonding thing with some of our projects, too. That's a whole different, that's a finance issue yeah. more than anything else. So most of our projects are multi-year. We don't have that many multi-phase projects, I guess, at this point. We, T.J. O'Grady was one where they did come back for a phase two. That's evaluated on a standalone business, standalone basis. We don't commit to that. So when you come in, if we know you're going to do multi-phase, there's no, there's no guarantee you're going to get yeah. funding, and that's part of our deliberation. Mm -hmm. Do we want to build a bridge halfway to nowhere <laughs> and find out two years from now your bridge is half done? So we kind of wrap that in. So again, multi-year versus multi-phase is the distinction I would draw. Okay, let's go to the ladies. Um, Most of our multi-year projects are town projects, and it's part of the capital budgeting process for the town the town sponsor to, to figure out how much money they're going to need going forward for five, ten years, whatever it is. Uh, we're the same. We yeah. will not, if we give design and engineering funds this year, we do it with a warning that this is no guarantee right. that they're going to get construction money next year, but we ask them how much it's going to cost just so that we know exactly. because we're going to get asked the question. Yeah. Yeah. But no, we, no promises. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. And the same in Concord. And I just want to add though that sometimes an applicant will come in and say they have matching funds, um, but the matching funds that they're talking about are just last year's um, CPA money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a clever trick. Yeah, and so um, you know, town meeting might 
be fooled by that book, but our committee is, part of our job is to say, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, uh, we have about one more minute left for questions. Judy's got her hand up, so go ahead, Judy. Yeah, to follow up question, I think, to, to Linda's, and that is, right. this is for uh, Lexington and Acton. Um, how do you approach a project that comes in and says, we'd like to get 200,000, 500,000 this year, to put in the bank to yeah. build up enough money to be able to do a project. So right. it's a multi-year project, but they're banking the funds. We've never had one. No, okay. Okay, yeah. who else? No, no, it's not. No. You haven't had one? No, nope, we haven't had one. Okay. okay. Well, and I think our committee would have a problem with that. And so Terry okay. talking about past projects. It wouldn't pass the sniff test at town meeting. Mm -hmm. That's one of our rules. Mm -hmm. so, so, that, so what do you do if there's a $3 million project? Do you just bond it or do you do a little bit each year? What do you guys, well, that's how we get into this situation. Yeah. Well, no, because you can't, you can't bond something you don't have the money to get them for to begin with. Right. So that's even the bonding is, we're committing this amount of money and then finance says, we want to bond it. Two separate issues. We can't partially bond and say, we're going to give you a million dollars and then bond the two million. It's, it's a, mm. sorry, come back to us until later. Okay, Marilyn, anything else? Uh, no. <laughs> Steph, you can use the last 30 seconds. Go. Quick question. It sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, Lexington and Acton have bonded projects. Yes. Concord never has bonded projects. Um, I think Concord has, but I'm not. Linda, do you know? I, I don't think we have. No. That's what I thought. We, okay. like. we use free cash. Okay. Right. We use free right. cash. Mm -hmm. Projection bill. We use free cash. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the questions. I want to give, first, I'm going to do the panelists all around of applause. To do our last minute wrap up, I'm going to turn this over to Dory and to Artis and then to Julie to see if there's any last minute things they want to add up. So you've got another five, ten minutes to say what's coming up. Thank you, whatever you want to do. Or is there anything you want to do? No, I have just to thank you all again and a reminder to follow up on something that Julie said. We will not be having a first Friday in December. People seem to have enough just looking ahead for the next month. But on January 10th, and it's a church across the street, in case you weren't aware, the West Concord Union Church. We're doing this really mainly because of the difficulty in scheduling the very few meeting places in Concord. And this is a possibility that we're going to try. And that will be all about trash looking at it from a local point of view and looking at it more in a national and international. Where are we going to put this stuff? Who's going to buy it? What's Concord doing? So that should be a very interesting one. We're going to be trying different places. The possibility of even using a town facility um, at Kai's Road for another First Friday. As mm -hmm. We really need to look more broadly. And so we're being aggressive. And if you have any space in your house that's big enough for this group, <laughs> this group or a little bit larger, you never know. We might be after you. But again, to thank you all very much um, for this, it's been really helpful, and I think from Concord's point of view, we probably have some new ideas mm -hmm. and, and new perspectives. Good. Uh, Artist, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Okay. Julie, do you have any last minute words before we call yeah. it quits? Well, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, we will also, our voter service people are doing a workshop in November on how to run for right. office, which is on November. It's November 6th. Here. It's a Saturday, November 6th, uh, starting at 10 o'clock. Over at um, Harvey Wheeler. November 16. No, yeah. excuse me. 16. 16. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the one in front. Uh, yeah. November 16th, a Saturday, 10 to 11.30 in the morning. Uh, and we're doing it in conjunction with the town clerk's office. It's to encourage people to run for office. That's the overall objective, but it's basically uh, Carrie Kari will come in and explain from her point of view what one needs to do if you're running for office, just kind of regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we'll have a panel of, um, that will include Cynthia Rainey, who is on the school committee, so she's obviously run two times for office. Um, uh, Susan Bates, who's a select board member. Um, Tar, um, Tar Lerner. Tar, yes, uh, who is on Concord Housing Authority. Oh, yeah and uh, Carmen Reese, who's our town moderator. So we'll have them as panelists talking about how they decided to run, kind of the ins and outs, and then an opportunity for Q&A. Uh, so please, uh, we're gonna start advertising it, uh, encourage your friends to come, you come, but we wanna start generating uh, publicity, knowledge, et cetera, so that people start thinking about running for office in town, because we know and <coughs> active participation in government is the best way to have a, a town government. Thank you, Judy. Anything else, Julie? Um, just thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope we will see you at future league events.
That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.